This isn't a this isn't a formal succession handover. So. <laughs> just a it's just a chat, Martin. This is on our way. Is it? We're on our way. Um, I am looking quite young, aren't I? Um, <laughs> but but obviously nervous. You need prompt cards. For you, Martin, of course. <laughs> so, uh, OK, I'm going to do that prompt card now. Um, I always remember somebody took my notes from me, actually, right? <laughs> at a very important meeting, and I remember looking through them. <laughs> so, so, Martin, if you look at the business yeah. you started, yeah. which famously was synonymous with big advertising agencies, the Ogilvy's, the JWT's, the Y&R's that you started with. Well, it wasn't actually, you know, we started in those unfashionable sectors. We started in the, uh, be beneath the salt, below the, it was called below the, the line. line in those days, which, which was stuff that exalted people like you never touched. So you, you sort of, it was beneath you to get involved in that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Actually, which and, is, and here which I am is, now talking about advocacy. Yeah, well, you're, you, you know, you're trying Funny to create, change. You're trying to create conferences. You know, for, um, <laughs> you're, you're trying to create. create uh, I mean, I think the whole thing. You know, the answer to the question is: is is advocacy fundamentally changing? The answer is no, and um, uh, it's a false distinction, basically. Advocacy, advocacy is part is part of advertising. They reinforce one another. I mean, it's just um, an evolution. But if you look at the big advertising businesses that you own, and you look at the shape of WPP today, and you look at where your clients are spending mm -hmm. their money, mm -hmm. surely that's a very different... No, it's not. It, well, first, first of all, so if you take uh, the company as a whole, so we're, we're $20 billion of uh, revenues. Um, and, you know, we, uh, Gideon is here. Where's Gideon? Yeah, so he's heard this stuff before you heard this last, last week. But, but OK, you, could, you can recite it then, Gideon. Um, which is that this, uh, what you regard, what you say is the, the big agencies um, in term, out of the 20s, five. So there's 15 by definition, which is nothing to do with what you call the big agencies. And um, so life has changed. And of the 15, uh, five is media, six is uh, digital, uh, and the other five is data. And so, I mean, you can say, well, that's not advocacy. Surely. Now, then, if you think about the $75 billion of billings that we manage on behalf of clients, uh, $3 billion, our biggest media relationship is now Google, uh, which comes back to the advocacy thing. And mm -hmm. Now, what within Google, you've got the bloggers here. Now, the, 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 the two big growth areas with Google, the two things that have moved Google from $2.5 billion in 2013 to $3 billion in 2014 are mobile search and video of which vlogging yep. is a part. So, and then there's other parts like d uh, display, social generally, um, that come into, or desktop search as well, which are all part of it. Mm -hmm. But essentially, that, that media relationship, and by the way, I mean, it's sacrilege to say this in front of this, this audience, but the, 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 media, the media part of it is, is as important as the message and may have become more important. Because you, I'm not sure if you said this to, if, if this was Gideon reported this or somebody else, but I think you talked about us now being, moving from having been madmen to maths men. Yeah, well, we, we talked about, uh, and women as well, just to be, just to get this, we don't want Claire Enders beating Claire. down the door to say, what are you doing again? All right, so, so, uh, and she's listening to every word. Um, so, no, no, so it's, it's, um, it is, and it, we're, we're recruiting different types of people. We're trying to get, uh, you know, yesterday we, we acquired uh, for Zaxis a uh, mobile app developer, basically, which is a company, which is a company, which is an interesting company, small, but very interesting. In terms. So we're continuously trying to adapt the offer that we have um, to what is going on in the marketplace. Now, beyond Google, actually, interestingly, you drop down rapidly to our exposure to Facebook, which has gone up to only, only about $650 million last year, whereas, whereas in 13 it was three, uh, 439, if my memory serves me right. So, and this year we're targeting with the Facebook people one and a quarter billion, and that's similar, driven by mobile, driven by video. So what well, advocacy is, it, to my mind, is an extension 
its uh, um, amplification. The, the other very interesting thing is, if I go to the, the data part of it, um, Eric Salama and his, his um, gosh, these couches are uncomfortable. <laughs> er, Eric, Salama, <laughs> Eric Salama and his colleagues at uh, Kantar, uh, everybody was, was always talked about frequent users being um, important. Actually, what we're finding is trial is really important. Uh, because it was always, you know, the, 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 the common wisdom was that the more frequency of use you, you manage to achieve with consumers, the better it is. Actually, what we're finding is that, that penetration, um, rather than frequency of use, is becoming more and more important. So, so, it, so advocacy will be a stage. You get people to, through advertising, to trial, and then you move people through advocacy uh, to loyalty and frequent use. But what's really interesting is it's, it's really about trial now. I mean, with the big package goods companies, and one can't talk to so much to telecommunications companies, but with the big package goods companies, this has re really resonated very strongly. So I would see advocacy as being a stage in the, the journey, and obviously the new media, whether they be social or whatever, uh, amplify those. Uh, it's interesting if you, if you look at these across sectors, Martin, because you mentioned telco, and we're going to talk to to our friends from the telco sector uh, in a little while. But if you get to a stage where, in a developed uh, Western economy, you have eight million households out of the twenty-four million households in your, right. uh, you know, and then you look at the fact that people, on average, will have ninety friend, ninety to one hundred friends in social media. You suddenly start asking yourself, do you really need to be having fresh conversations in advertising with people, or do you need to be much better managing you know, the conversations that uh, your customers have with other customers? Well, this, once is, this is where the Kantar work is really interesting, TNS and Millwood Brown, because if, if it is true that trial is, is becoming more and more important or is the primary driver, the answer to your question is that you, know, you have to look at other things in addition to advocacy, and advocacy mm -hmm. is more about you know, stimulating loyalty, love, whatever, you know what I mean? The stuff that we're doing, whether it's at, at uh, J. Walter Thompson Company, or Ogilvy, or Gray, or y &R. I mean, in preparation for this um, uh, in-depth interview, <laughs> um, <laughs> I asked for, and I won't bore you with the case studies, they were kind of, but for example, this, the, the thing that RKCR did with BBC this, in the last couple of weeks, the love button, uh, that uh, they have in terms of the, some of the internet work they've done is a good example of that and loves have exceeded likes apparently in the first couple of weeks of use of that. So I think there are some really interesting things that we're doing but on the nature of our business, coming back to the question about changing the advertising business and these, these, these legacy uh, agency businesses that you refer to, uh, they're no longer legacy agency businesses or if they were legacy agency businesses and they remain so, they go out of business. So, but how do you, so, sorry, Martin, how do you, because as WPP, mm -hmm. you have a whole number of very modern, non legacy yeah. businesses. You were an early investor in Vice. Yes. Uh, probably one of the most exciting we were, businesses. We, we were an expert in Vice. You were an expert as, in Vice. As, a, very, as the head of a big media company said, Vice is our middle name. Yeah. So, that's an incredibly modern brand people are very excited about it you own a significant well let me let me tell you a story about sort of about vice because, which I, I think is quite interesting everybody might be bored so so, so when when we 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 bought we still have 10 percent of vice we're the largest shareholder beyond shane and his colleagues um so uh, rupert and uh, fox have five uh, percent and disney has five pending their their deal hbo who did their programming deal with them last week so, which I don't know whether it's a publicly um, um, registered statistic, but they've done a $400 million programming deal with HBO. So it's quite remarkable if you think about it. I mean, forget mm -hmm. about us, mm -hmm. that you have Fox, you have Disney, you have Time Warner, all in the same vehicle. Anyway, so when we invested, which is about four years ago, I had extensive conversations with Shane Smith and Eddie Moretti. And I remember I, I left New York, and it, was, it must be exactly four years ago, because we just went to John Chambers' CEO, CIO conference in Kewa Island last week. And it was, it was not the one before, but the one before that, so it's four years ago. 
and Shane had been, you know, uh, the, biggest, uh, the biggest client at that time was Intel with a, with a thing called the Curators Project, if I remember rightly. And Shane said, this has revitalized and repositioned Intel with millennials. And I thought, yeah, 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 yeah. So I thought, well, uh, I'll, uh, so we, we finished our little conversation, Neil. I went to Keogh Island, and I walk into the room, and there's about 20 or 30 CEOs, and there's Paul Lottolini there, who I didn't know well, but so I said, well, I'll, I'll show Shane. And I'll go up to Paul. And I went up to Paul, tapped him on the shoulder, hello, how are you? What do you think about Vice? He said, brilliant. He said, they have totally repositioned Intel with millennials. And so, now I don't know whether Shane called him and said, Martin's coming down. <laughs> I don't think he did, but, but the, the, the point, and you're seeing that with AT&T now, because the biggest client of, of Vice now, as, as is with uh, Peter Chernin's full screen, so which we're also an investor mm -hmm. in. So that's 100 YouTube channels. Peter did a, a programming deal called Otter Media, which again was purportedly uh, 500, or reported as being $500 million of online programming. So adjacent to what you're going to be talking today. Um, and it was another example. And AT&T are now the biggest client of that, biggest developer of that. We do the media for AT&T in America. And the biggest producer uh, and the biggest client uh, in the case of Vice. Although I don't know post the, the HBO deal whether that will necessarily be the case. But the point of the story is for positioning with millennials or now even more importantly centennials who, who've got very different habits to, to millennials. If you look at all the data, and we did a session at Keir Island last week on this with John Chambers and Cisco and a number of other people. Uh, very different habits and very big changes taking place. So I don't know whether you're going to draw that distinction but, today, but you should actually because it, it's very different. The up to 15 year olds are very different in their social habits and the data is markedly different, markedly different. For example, are the, the attitude to Snapchat, the mm -hmm. attitude to you know, your parents looking over your shoulder uh, and looking at what you're doing and how you're doing it is very, very different amongst that. Well, let me ask you, Martin, how do you, though, in, a, in, a, in today's WPP, yeah. bring to your clients all of the benefits of those investments? Because Vice is a very clever business, but how do I well, it's with that? It, the, the, your... honest answer that the, the brutally honest answer is it's with difficulty. Um, because it's very difficult for people... For, so, for example, um, uh, Shane has started a, an agency called Virtue. And, uh, uh, you know, if you look at, uh, look at another sort of vice-like thing, Fusion, which is the, the joint, the Hispanic channel that Disney and Univision have put together, the news channel run by... It's a, the head of it is a guy called Isaac Lee, who who sort of comes from the editorial side, but runs, runs the whole thing. So if you look at that, and he's formed um, uh, a relationship with Bogusky, you know, in mm -hmm. Denver. To, so, so, you mm -hmm. know, in, in a way, they're trying to develop a sort of agency-type business. So yeah. the answer to your question is, it is with difficulty. Yeah. But I think what you have to do is you have to, you know, you know and we, we have not done this perfectly, but we've done it reasonably well, but not as well as we should do is to educate our people. You know, if, if, if I hear another client, what drives me nuts is when I hear a client or one of our people are saying, I didn't know WPP did that, or I didn't know we had access to that, this, that, or the other. Now, they're coming back just, just to the fundamentals, what has changed? It, it may be, I, I don't agree with this proposition, but it may be that Omnicom has a few good people. <laughs> it may be that, highly unlikely that publicists has a, but possible, that possible, that, Publicist does, even less likely that IPG or Havas or Dentsu. But it, let's accept for the purpose of this conversation that it's possible. They, they're good people too. It's a hypothetical. Hypothetically. Uh, then you say, well, how can you differentiate yourselves? You, then you get into the data piece, you get the technology piece, and you get the content piece. Those three areas, to my mind, are where you will get the significant differentiation. So in technology, it would be at Nexus with us and Zaxis. So we have the, bi the biggest programmatic platform, which other people call programmatic. We layer it with data and technology, but let's call it programmatic. And then you, you get, a, you get a, a piece of technology or a platform which meaningfully differentiates you with the media owner Google, because mm -hmm. Google is a media owner. It's not, mm -hmm. 
it's not a technology company they like to, to, to position this. And the same thing goes for Facebook. So Facebook has Atlas, Google has DoubleClick, we have AppNexus together with Zaxis, that's our, that's our technology mm -hmm. play. And then we spice it up with things like we did. How do you put it together then, for then clients, data. though, Martin? How, so do, how do you make that coherent for a client? Well, it, Because that's we, great for WPP, we have two, how do you We have make two that? integrators, two integrators, some of them sitting in this room. Uh, we have 45 client leaders now, 46, <coughs> who manage a third, effectively a third of our businesses, about 7 billion out of the 20. There are about, I think, 45,000 people that work on those clients in one, one way or another. And they have to integrate it. Ultimately, we're saying to those people, you quotes unquote run the business, mm -hmm. which creates great tensions between the verticals. Because they have the separate bottom yeah, lines. So you're running a vertical, which we own 49%. I don't know which 49% of you we own. But, <laughs> but, but I hope it's the top half, not the bottom half. Um, um, so, or maybe I'll second thought the bottom half will be equally acceptable. Anyway, the the uh, <laughs> the so that's that's what, so you get these tensions between the verticals and the horizontals, but really that's it. And there, there are two really good examples: Ford and Colgate. So Team Detroit and Red Fuse, basically. Now, what, what's needed for that is for the client to buy into that. Because it's all very well for us to have, to have one selling point, if I can put it like yeah. this. But if the client has, still has multiple buying points, you have a problem. So if the client consolidates and says, you know, I want to integrate my offer. I want to, to hand over integration to the agency, which is critically important. Yeah. Because if the client believes that they should do the integration, you're doomed, not doomed to failure, but it's going to be very much more difficult. The client has to decide that they'd rather spend their time on what I think is the more important thing, which is thinking about the things more strategically rather than tactically. Because we have, you know, we have 180,000 people in one way or another in 111 countries. And you know, following a craft Heinz move, like last week, mm -hmm. which is, just think about it for a minute, you know, it's the, after the 3G ABI push, after the 3G Burger King, Tim Horton push. After the 3G Heinz push, we've now gone to Kraft. Now, the interesting thing about Kraft, you see in the Sunday newspapers, that it doesn't stop at Kraft. It's going to be Kraft picking up from Mondelez, mm -hmm. the cheese brands, and taking them international. Now, if you think about that for a minute, uh, and you think about their zero-based budgeting approach and their focus on cost, us taking on the integration them outsourcing the integration becomes an even more potent model, right? Now, we, could, we can agree or disagree with you know, these cost-based models, because it's not just in the package goods industry, by the way. It's in the pharmaceutical industry as well. Valiant and Endo, it's look-alike Endo, are, are building pharmaceutical companies that don't invest in R&D. Now, I think that's a little bit of an oxymoron, because who ever heard of a pharmaceutical company that didn't invest in R&D? But these models, which are very cost-based, and some people believe to be short-term to medium-term and not long-term, are changing the face. And by the way, don't underestimate the importance of what happened last week with Kraft Heinz. That's a really significant development. Great management, utility brands, cheap money, and cheap money will be with us for longer than people think, I think. It will be lower, rates will be lower longer, mean that consolidation of this nature, as we were talking about last night, in a low growth world with very little pricing power and very little inflation means that clients regrettably, in my view, but it's life, are focused on the cost side of the equation rather than the brand side of the equation. I also just ask where the integration starts, because in the old days, of course, people used to talk about lead agencies and the lead agency used to start with the, mm -hmm. traditionally with the advertising yeah. agency, largely because they sort of had the strategic firepower to be thinking about what the yeah. brand idea was, etc. Now, as you look at, advocacy, you look at content, you look at analytics and etc. and you've talked yeah. about mass men. Does the integration now start with the analytics? Does it start with the data? Does it start in the media? It feels like that's more the centre of gravity than the traditional ad agency used to be as lead agency. Well, uh, you know, I, I'm a great believer in individuals, in people, and I'm a great believer in leaders. And I think the best example, and I mentioned two, mm -hmm. right? 
I mentioned Ford and I mentioned Colgate. Now, why is it that they've been su uh, so successful so far? One is that the client has made a clear statement. You know, Mullally, now Mark Fields, one Ford. Colgate, you know, started with Y&R, morphed into not Y&R brands, and then has morphed into du to WPP, and everybody's mm -hmm. quite clear. We don't do everything, but we do, you know, a, a lot. And on our side, we've had a very strong leader. So if it's Satish Corday and Mark Lenev, Mark Lenev was so strong that the client hired him. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we have Steve Forciani at Colgate. And those are two classic examples. Now, are those people easy for our people to deal with? No, because they have a very you know, rigorous, mm -hmm. disciplined approach. And they don't take any prisoners. You know, if, if the client gives them the marching orders, which they have done, they get on with it. So the answer to that, you know, what's the integration point? It's a, a strong leader like that. I think that's the best. But I go beyond that, and, and then you can say, because you could have, you know, J. Walter Thompson Company as the, the portal. Mm -hmm. you know, we were with one of our clients last week in New York, big pharmaceutical client, and the, the portal for WPP is, and Gustavo Martinez, who runs uh, JWT, who was at Ogilvy, left us foolhardily to go to McCann, but then saw the, the, the wisdom, uh, came back, and really aggressive leader at, uh, at uh, JWT. And he's, he's the port he sees himself in that particular case as being the portal for it and drives the integration. It is very difficult because the leaders of the verticals have to surrender control of some of their biggest, if not their biggest clients to these client integrators. And, so and they have a bottom, they have a vertical bottom line target, which you give them, yes. ironically, yeah. that they have to hit. So do the horizontals. And, and then the horizontal has so a target, and those better. two things compete. But this, yeah, but these, and these are the, this is the classic matrix problem inside any organization. I mean, that's, and then there's a third one to add complication to it. At a country level, we operate in 111 countries. Mutar Kent always tells me that, you know, Coca-Cola operates in 220 countries. I say, Mutar, there aren't 220 <laughs> countries in the world. And um, so it's, you know, it's the, it, the independent state of XYZ, you know, in the, in the Olympic Games opening ceremony, you see these guys coming around with boards from countries you never knew existed. Um, and so it, it, it's, how is it possible for somebody in Atlanta or London or New York to know what goes on in 111 countries, let alone 220? So you had to have, in my view, you had to have country managers. Mm -hmm. And what clients are doing is really interesting. So G is in the van of this. 19 business units, functional and, and uh, geographic country. And they're taking out the regional management because that's the block. Mm -hmm. Now, Jeff Immelt said at the Microsoft Congress in last year, regional, apologies to any regional managers in the audience or anybody listening to this or when Gideon writes his notes on this, uh, to, <laughs> to regional, if he's allowed to write. He's written that down. Shit. Um, anyway, so the regional, the regional people, they are blocks to stuff coming down. and stuff, They have the power to say no, not the power to say yes. And this is happening inside a large number of companies. It's a really, I think, an important, important development. And related to the craft yeah. mind thing, because you know, it's another, another area of cost, you know, indirect costs as a proportion of revenue that they're, they're taking out. So it all sort of harmonizes. But the answer for us is the portal can be a myriad of things. I don't think the portal is the problem, or the point of access is the problem. The, the problem for us is educating everybody to what we have. That's the problem. Because as you say, yeah. we have the horizontal, we have yeah. the verticals, we have these, this matrix system, and it is very difficult. Yeah. And turf and turf, you know, the better the people, the worse it is. Mm -hmm. now, good people are difficult to deal with. Average people are easy. Yeah. And, and that's the real, the real problem. And good people are always opinionated because they've been successful. So they say, you know, basis of my success, you know, I, you know, I'm more intelligent than you. You're not like that, though, Martin. No. That's a good thing. Let me... Completely... Let me... <laughs> I, gave, I gave up dealing with people like you, Johnny. I gave up years ago. I gave up years ago. Let me throw this open to uh, some questions, if Fine. you don't mind. Uh, no problem. Martin. Victoria. Martin. So as, as the... Um, as You've you got a microphone here. Yeah. I often yeah. don't need a microphone. <laughs> Hi. 
So as you sit above a company that started as wire and plastic products, yes. can we have a little chat about procurement? About procurement? Yeah, and their kind of role as we look I've at... I've got to go, actually. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. So, so, so as a lot of our job is about value, not cost, Yes. and procurement's job is bringing down cost in almost every business, mm. what's the right way to go into that discussion? I wish I knew the answer to that question. Um, I mean, I think broadly there are two buckets of clients. There's one bucket of clients that you can have a rational... And by the way, you know, Ford is a great example of that. Maybe it's because they're an engineering culture and therefore they can always engineer uh, a problem. But, you know, with them they will say to us, look, this is our objective, and it might be a very uncomfortable objective. You know, we want to reduce cost by X, for example. But what they say is, we will help you get to that target by looking at scope of work, by looking at the processes that we have to go through and eliminating you know, stuff that we don't think mutually that is important and we'll, we'll speed up the decision making so it isn't as complicated. And we, you know, you, you, it, I always you describe it as a game of ping pong that went up on a, ever ascending levels and then if one of the, 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 the links in the chain said no, you had to, you all collapsed and you had to start again. By the way, if McKinsey have that, yeah, they, they, they down pencils and they start again. We in our business don't want to do that. And the last thing we want to do is piss off the client, right? make them upset. So, so we always, you know, because, you know, the thing that drives our business is, is the question is, is the client happy? No, that's not the question that you get at McKinsey or Goldman necessarily, right? Sometimes you do, but not necessarily. So there's the constructive bucket. Then there is the destructive bucket with the, who say, I want to get to that, that objective, and if you don't do it, you're fired. And it reached its, its, it reached its worst in 2009, when we were, you know, we as an industry were treated, you know, I shouldn't say this, but as domestic servants. And we're not, you know, I, 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 I'm realistic enough to believe that we are junior partners, not equal partners, and I accept that. And that's the basis on which we do it. But it is a partnership. And I do think we can make a very significant <laughs> contribution, particularly in a world where there is low growth, particularly in a world where there is limited pricing power, particularly in a world where there has been retail concentration, which has meant that manufacturers have been excluded from the consumer relationship. And that's changing because of proximity, retailing, and e-commerce. Right? So I think, I think we, we can make a really, really big contribution. That is not acknowledged. <laughs> Why is it not acknowledged? CEOs last for five to six years. CFOs last for four to five years. CMOs last for two to three years. One uh, media owner here told me that the average CMO in the UK is 26 months. So there's no, it's worse than politics. There is no, there is no longevity. There's no continuity. It's all about, you know, what, what I get it done in the last two or three years. The trouble with procurement is they have too much power. Low growth. You know, lack of pricing power, particularly post layman. And the other thing is that layman is seared into the consciousness of corporates. The world literally nearly came to an end financially. Warren Buffett said it, uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin's book, Too Big for to Fail. I mean, you want to read that, Jeff Immelt said it. You know, GE was within 48 hours being unable to refinance its commitments for GE Capital. It was teetering on the edge. That has made companies very, very cautious. They're sitting on $7 trillion in net cash. So procurement and finance, half of the FTSE 100, I'm a CFO, I'm in the FTSE 100, or we're in the FTSE 100, 50% are ex-CFOs. So it's only natural, given all that, and then non-executive directors don't want CEOs to make a mistake. I even see it with our company. You know, whatever you do, don't make a boo-boo. Don't drop the ball. So the, the whole system is against risk. You know, activist investors, share buybacks, increase the dividend, you know, M&A activity, you know, it's, there was a bit of a boomlet, but that's cost driven. It's not, it's not growth driven. And so I think in that environment, procurement sort of flourishes. Now, how do you engage with them? You have to engage on the basis that, that you deliver value. I mean, even on, you know, they think the media is sugar. Yeah, many as we found out. It, yeah, it isn't sugar. Right? The, the problem is, you know, consultants come in and try and evaluate it. There are so many moving, moving parts. A year later, you know, the, the agent, you know, if you open, I won't I'll get myself into real trouble if I <laughs> go into detail. But there is a case, right, where 
a client said, uh, we are going to, we're going to put at risk, 20, uh, we're, we're going to ask the agency, the winning agency, to put at risk 25% of the fee on a media buying exercise. And the agency that won it said to themselves, well, if it's only 25% of the fee that's at risk, we can promise anything and everything. And they did that. So they, they over-promised. They're not delivering. The client, you know, it, it, as sure as eggs are eggs, it, it'll, it'll come out. It's going to happen. And we've seen several examples of that. And the worst, worst, you know, the agencies, by the way, are the worst offenders, really. Do I think that somebody in Japan Oh, it's, knows what goes on inside the agency that they acquired? No. You've only got to look at it, the collapse in their margins. The margins have gone from 15% to 7.5% in two years. You know the agency I'm talking about. Do I think that somebody sitting in, in that massive office block in Tokyo really knows they've given guarantees or pricing guarantees? No. Do I think... But the one of our competitors in America sits in Palm Beach worrying about that? No. I actually do think that our, one of our French competitors does know about that. Because he's so nosy, he, he will be, he'll be acquainted with it. To fair's fair. But I think that's the fundamental problem. So you have two things. One is you have to engage with the, the client in a constructive way. And then secondly, you have to be, if you run the agency or try to run the agency, you have to be very sort of precise about what people can do and what they can't do. So, Martin, before Sorry. before we get you writs for defamation of character from, from <laughs> Japan and Palm Beach... <laughs> I'm willing shall, to back it up shall, with facts, Johnny. <laughs> with we, facts. Shall, we shall leave it there. Martin, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank you.